Hello. Um, welcome to this Gold Room Lecture tonight. It's going to be given by a very dear friend and colleague, David Ibbotson. Um, David is now subject leader in English at North Lindsay, which is in Lincolnshire. And he and I did our PhDs together at the University of Leeds. Um, he has published on Boy's Imperial Fiction, on Jerome K. Jerome, on Boy's Own Adventure Stories, on the Music Hall, Victorian Popular Culture, and now he's working on a book proposal on Victorian comedy. So please welcome David Ibbotson. Uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, I want to start off with this, this, this quote I put up here. This is um, from the jokes page of the Victorian magazine for young boys called Young, young England, um, an illustrated magazine for recreation and instruction, uh, which boldly promised readers wit, humor, fun, and mirth on its front page. Um, and here readers are presented with a comic depiction of effects of town life on, uh, on its inhabitants. So I'll just read it with you here. Two boys sent to the country by a fresh air fund thus conversed. Say, Pat. Will we see apples on trees? Of course you will, said his companion, with a tone of conscious superiority. But I don't like them, added he. I ate some in the country last summer, and they were sour. Apples that grow in barrels is best. And that's pretty much what passed for wit and humour at this point in the 19th century. So, so obviously, uh, the joke lies in the boy's misunderstanding of the fundamentals of nature. Um, but it places the reader, by default, into the position of the experienced listener who's um, familiar with the natural world. So the implication here is that a literate representative of young England would have an innate capacity to be at home in the natural world rather than a, a mere inhabitant of the city. And this, this comic skit uh, gestures towards a perceived uh, late Victorian urban malaise um, as well as its proposed cure. Uh, the Fresh Air Fund referenced in this um, was an organisation set up to get children out of the city for the good of their health. Um, and education. I, I believe there's still a, a variation of this running in New York at the moment. Um, and this cure would be given uh, national importance in the emphasis that it placed on conditioning um, a particularly important imperial resource, and that was the British boy. So, on the 19th of September, uh, 1864, the famous uh, missionary and explorer, uh, Dr. David Livingston, addressed the British Association in Bath, giving an account of his African uh, explorations. And when discussing the topic of, in his words, civilizing and Christianizing the African, his speech turned to matters much closer to home. Um, the best way of treating these degraded people, Dr. Livingston said, uh, must always be very much like that which is pursued in the ragged schools. Their bodily wants must be attended to as the basis of all efforts at their salvation. Now, the ragged schools that Livingston's referring to here um, is the Ragged School Union, which, was, uh, which provided education and food and lodging to destitute children in the city. Um, they also arranged trips out into the countryside for them. Um, what Livingston is doing here is he's demonstrating a late Victorian rhetorical tactic of uh, comparing missionary work in city slums to, to exploration overseas. Um, so frequently in these kind of texts, we get the East End of London recast as, as Africa. Um, and I say this is a, a feature of, of many uh, Victorian, what we call urban exploration texts. So in this speech by Livingston, uh, imperialism, adventure, uh, the church, and urban escape are all united uh, with the necessity to rectify the body. But of course, the sickly body that he's talking about here is not just the physical body, but it's also a body of people. It's the urban youths of Britain. Uh, consequently, the late 19th century uh, saw increasing efforts for the rehabilitation of city youths, um, evident in such organizations as the Fresh Air Fund and the Ragged School Union. And this process would eventually adopt uh, more overtly militaristic aspects with the arrival of the Boys' Brigade and, of course, the Boy Scout movement. Uh, and all these were designed to get British and usually male youths out of the city for the good of their masculinity, but also for the good of the nation. Now, uh, in this talk, I want to tell you a bit about these organisations um, and how they helped to construct and popularise a late Victorian um, idea of masculinity. Uh, and I want to look at the role played in this by the figure of the British boy as well. I also want to discuss how these organisations worked in tandem with boys' own magazines at the time. So these are magazines aimed at young boys and they're kind of mainly filled with uh, adventure stories and sport and, and British history. Um, and how these also work to create this aspirational figure. Um, so a key issue here will be the extent to which these texts saw themselves as having a responsibility to 
um, instruct boys on how to behave and how to act, um, highlighting a perceived need to perform a certain kind of masculinity. But what I also want to show is how some of these key adventure narratives which um, kind of advertise this adventurousness um, by writers like Henry Morton Stanley and H. Ryder Haggard and G.A. Henty also portray uh, what we might see as weak points um, in its viability as a, as, a, as a working model of masculinity. So, this connection of escape from the city with national fitness had already, in fact, been made by Livingston, um, whose writing uh, promoted the idea that open-air travel uh, in the African countryside uh, was in and of itself a healthy activity. Um, I'll show you here. Um, this is his portrait in um, his book Missionary Travels and Researches in South Africa, which came out in 1857, um, which was a massively popular and incredibly well-selling account of his travels through Africa. Um, apparently, George Eliot is on record at commenting how handsome he looks in this picture, so this is, this is what passed for the, the height of handsomeness in the mid-19th century. Um, so in this book, he explains that um, wagon travelling in Africa as he puts it, is essentially a prolonged system of picnicking, excellent for the health. Um, and he notes how the climate alone aids people in recovering from complaints closely resembling consumption. Um, here's just a passage I want to read from here, uh, from, from, from this text. Um, I've never seen the beneficial effects of in the inland climate on persons of shattered constitutions, nor heard their high praises of the benefit they have derived from traveling without wishing that its bracing effects should become more extensively known in England. No one who has visited the region I have above mentioned fails to remember with pleasure the wild, healthful gypsy life of wagon traveling. Um, so it's no wonder that, that Livingston should endorse the work of the Ragged School Unions in his speech before, as, as they were essentially uh, a domestic embodiment of his travel as cure philosophy here, um, as well as his missionary work. Um, actually, there's, there's every reason to suspect he was rather an unsuccessful missionary, um, but the Victorians were never uh, ones to let the facts get in, in the way of a good imperial hero story. So. So this idea of healthy travel would also be found in the works of H. Ryder Haggard, the, uh, the arch novelist of colonial heroism. So in uh, novels like uh, King Solomon's Mines, um, which is about three men who uh, adventurously uh, travel. Oh, there's, there's H. Ryder Haggard there. Um, King Solomon's Mines, which is about three uh, men who adventurously travel into a, a dangerous and undiscovered African country. And novels like She, um, which is about three men who adventurously travel into a dangerous and undiscovered African country. He was a versatile writer. Um, Haggard is, um, as Wendy Katz has argued, a figure who contributed generously to the process of shaping uh, the imperial mentality. And so it's interesting that his views, um, we find his views coincide with Livingston's actually. So in Haggard's novel, The Witch's Head, uh, which published in 1884, which for a change is about uh, three men who adventurous, adventurously travel into an actually real African country for a change. Empire is, as Katz has noted, associated not so much with British rule as with a good, healthy place to be. Um, like Livingston, Haggard's event, uh, uh, narrator directly addresses his readership, uh, saying, and so my reader, day adds itself to day, and each day will find you healthier, happier, and stronger than the last. No letters, no newspapers, no babies, Oh, think of it, uh, think of the joy of it, a fet Caucasian, and go, buy, go and buy an ox wagon and do likewise. So the reader here is assumed to be enervated and in need of some sort of masculinizing resource. Um, and Africa itself becomes uh, the magic bullet for imperial fitness. Uh, indeed, in, in Haggard's novels, there is a preoccupation with sort of going into the earth uh, repeatedly. And in King Solomon's mines, they go into some mines, obviously. Uh, in She, they go into a volcano. In a, a later book called The Yellow God, they have to go underground to, uh, to get themselves out of prison. Uh, it's as if the soil itself has a sort of vitality about it. And it's not necessarily the desire of the protagonists that they should always venture underground, um, but it's the necessity of the plot that they must um, for reasons of masculine and narrative development. So what we see in these urban escape programs seems to be a recreation of these imperial ideas um, in Britain. It's a sort of domestication of colonial adventure narratives. So uh, we get the Ragged School Union, founded in 1844, um, and its own magazine, because it had its own sort of kind of magazine for members and, and fans, um, reveals that urban escape was high on its agenda. So in 1855, we get an article, articles called things like uh, the Ragged School Children Out of Town, talking about how children seek gratification in beautiful scenery and fresh air. Uh, in 1868, we get um, articles telling us that children were 
sent into the parks for fresh air and healthful play, which greatly increased their appetites. Uh, in 1870, we're told that fresh air provides respite from their normal uh, wretched localities um, with little or no variation. Uh, we're informed that the Union was helping children to see green fields and breathe fresh air, um, to move from the close atmosphere of the London court to the health-giving air of the country, and that they were providing fresh air and change for the poor, giving ailing and weakly children a fortnight's country air. These are all quotes from the, from the, from the magazine. But the ragged schools were um, part of a much, much wider trend. Pamela Horn has noted the founding in 1884 of the Country Holiday Fund um, by the charity organisation, as well as various Cinderella clubs that did the same job. Um, on the 25th of June 1881, the Times uh, ran an appeal for uh, funds to give a day in the country to the children and others of 13 schools and institutions. So evidently this, this pressing need for fresh air was a common idea by the time the Fresh Air Fund began in 1892. Um, the Fresh Air Fund was founded by Arthur Pearson, who's the uh, editor of the Daily uh, Express, and it was merely the latest expression of an already established social trope. So, however bound up with concepts of imperial vigorousness these escape programs already were, this connection uh, between um, bodily and national fitness would be made even more explicit with the founding of the Boys' Brigade, um, which combined escape with an overtly uh, militaristic ethos. Um, so, founded in 1883 by the Glasgow uh, businessman William Alexander Smith, the initial aim of the Boys' Brigade was to provide occupation and discipline for boys who were uh, too old for Sunday school, uh, but too young for the YMCA. Uh, and the promotion and strengthening of Christian faith in his boys was an overriding concern, and this was to be achieved by emphasizing its masculinity and uh, in Smith's words, presenting that view of Christianity which we knew their natures would most readily respond. So it was not just spiritual and moral health that the brigade was seeking to shore up. Um, and we get expressions of the, this familiar urban escape trope um, in its promotional rhetoric. So in an 1897 article on the Plymouth Company of the Boys' Brigade, which I have here, uh, which was published in the Boys' Own Paper, well, the Boys' Own Paper was uh, perhaps the most popular of the Victorian boys' magazines uh, at this point. Um, much is made in this article the fact that, uh, in the words of the, uh, the, the writer, all boys, especially those who live in the courts and alleys and narrow streets of crowded towns, uh, should have country excursions where there are no high buildings to shut out the sky and no smoky atmosphere for the sun to filter through. Um, Smith himself, in a later 1898 interview, again in the boys' own paper, is careful to add that uh, membership is not confined to one class of boy. So uh, if not the eradication of class distinction, the brigade is seen to do with class concerns in favor of national ones. Um, and this is evident when the boys' own paper notes that uh, the boys like the sea, and it is a fortunate thing for England that it is so, for she needs many sailors. So the escape of the boys' brigade bridges the gap between uh, just mere countryside excursion uh, and the manliness of the imperial hero, I think. And it's not merely escape, but muscular exercise, uh, which is to provide England with a cure for uh, masculine decline. Um, the camping trips offered by the brigade, um, which started in 1886, were seen to provide something vital as well. John Springhall has recorded uh, the importance placed by leaders of early Edwardian camps on the idea of, um, kind of camping as urban escape for its own kind of beneficial sake. Um, and in 1891, there was a letter uh, printed in the Times calling attention to the work of the, uh, the Council for the Welfare of Young Men in running a camp at Deal, um, and their aim was to form a brigade, in the Times' words, on lines somewhat similar to those on which the Boys' Brigade was founded, namely discipline, self-respect, and manliness. And there's that, that key word there. So in 1885, the Morning Post commented that uh, due to such large organisations as the Brigade, um, in its words, a very large section of the male population would begin a purely voluntary military training at a much earlier age than usual. Uh, and it comments that uh, such a shift would be an advantage. Um, now what it's referencing uh, here is the volunteer um, force, which was a part-time kind of amateur citizen <coughs> army which adults could join. So to whose advantage this training would be for uh, is left for the reader to infer, but it seems uh, likely that it's to the advantage of the nation as much as the advantage of the boys, I think. Uh, Springhall suggests that since the 1880s, 
Uh, a gradual shift in the aims of British youth movements had taken place, whereby ideologies of national purpose were effectively supplanting earlier religious and moral justifications. Uh, it is a displacement that he regards as incomplete until the founding of the Boy Scouts uh, in 1908. Uh, and Robert Baden Powell, the uh, soldier and founder of the Boy Scout movement, would provide the most explicit expression of urban escape's imperial importance um, in the sort of the guidebook for the movement, Scouting for Boys. He tells his young readers to, uh, well, it says, don't be disgraced like the young Romans who lost the empire of their forefathers by being wishy-washy slackers without any go or patriotism in them. So uh, the, the fate of the, the British Empire is at stake. Uh, incidentally, in that book, he also says that you can't trust boys with quiffs, that they're lazy and untrustworthy, so how much you want to throw your lot in with scouting for boys is, is up to you. Um, so in the 1898 Boys Own Paper interview, William Smith relates a story to demonstrate the effectiveness of the brigade. Um, he says that a few months ago, a small boy of 12, a private in the 12th Cardiff Company, dived off a swing bridge into the docks and saved the life of a schoolfellow who had fallen in. We are constantly hearing of the heroism of our boys everywhere. So Smith's uh, rhetoric here asserts an inherent boldness in his charges. His boys are full of, in his words, um, an earnest desire to be brave, true men. But he says that to achieve this, we must direct uh, this desire into the right channel. Um, and he supports this uh, by telling another story of a boy who was, in his words, a regular daredevil. No one could do much with him, and this boy was killed while saving the life of another boy playing on a railway, on some railway tracks. Okay. So the heroism detailed in this article is, is not in spite of, but facilitated by the boy's kind of unruliness and naughtiness. Um, and any manliness that they, they, they demonstrate is sort of dependent on this, and this rebelliousness is a persistent characteristic of the boy hero of adventure fiction. Um, it's evident, for example, in uh, Jim Hawkins, in uh, Robbie Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, who at one point saves the day by explicitly ignoring what all the adults tell him to do. Um, Charlie Marriott uh, in G.A. Henty's With Clive in India, um, which I'm going to talk a, a bit more, uh, in a bit more depth later on. Um, and uh, in characters like Storky from Rudyard Kipling's Storky and Co., which is a, a series of boarding school stories um, features, you know, which are kind of based around the eponymous Storky, who, uh, whose schoolboy misbehavior is shown to pr prepare him um, for life in the army. He pulls the same tricks um, at school as he does later on, uh, kind of in the Middle East, and, and that, that, that the heroism is seen on being dependent on his naughtiness. So this signals how we um, might see uh, literature and social efforts working in a sort of dialogue together. Um, and an important generator of these aspirations was the production of uh, the boys' journals that I've already started talking about, really. Um, emphasizing the importance of instilling ideals of a kind of youthful male heroism, publication like the boys' own paper, um, as Claire Pettit has noted, made boys feel important as if they were central social actors and would grow up to have exciting adventures in a mythic country called the Empire. It promised further that these empires would not only be exciting, um, but, or, yeah, albeit vaguely, somehow essential to national security. Um, so, in his interview with the boys' own paper, in his interview with the boys' own paper, um, it is manliness that is the watchword for Smith. Um, but this manliness is overtly Christian in nature. So he says that the officers are Christian men of a healthy and manly type. Uh, that the boys are smart and manly, and that the brigade uh, provides an occupation which should be manly and robust in its constitution and all that tends towards a true Christian manliness. But what we need to do here is look at the extent to which both these, um, both these strands of muscular Christianity seek to instruct or inculcate um, a manliness in its young readers and its participants. So um, what this does is this highlights a curious tension in this ideology, right? So if manliness has to be taught, then it, it can't be innate. Um, and if it's not innate, then there's a risk of not being to exact the necessary educational control over the boys. There's a risk that they might not be able to perform the right kind of masculinity. Um, and so we see in these boys' own magazines um, expectations for its readers that often seem rather anxious in their inability to succeed. Okay? 
so the conception of uh, masculinity was promoted uh, to readers of the similar magazine, Young England, in articles like uh, The Manliness of Christ, uh, and in the boy's own paper in um, really quite spectacularly titled articles like Some Manly Words for Boys by Manly Men, Part One, <laughs> True Manliness and How to Get It. I won't tell you how many parts there were to that running, that running article. Um, so it's worth noting that Young England, that I've already mentioned at the start, right, uh, bills itself as an illustrated magazine for recreation and instruction. That's the important part. Um, and its perceived job of instructing a correct masculinity is what I want to focus on now. So the Boys of England uh, ran from 1866 to 1899. Uh, and during the 1870s, it had a circulation of uh, about 250,000, as far as we can tell. Um, and it adopted a more imperially idealistic model of the thrilling kind of pen dreadful um, narratives uh, to occupy the same niche market. I'm assuming you've all kind of heard of penny dreadfuls, right? They're uh, kind of cheap, affordable, sensational publications full of uh, crime and violence and the supernatural. Sort of um, but this time, this kind of cheap, affordable, adventurous literature is couching itself in improving a potentially dis dissolute youth. Um, however, the, the physician and writer Havelock Ellis um, gives an account of being forbidden to read Boys of England by his mother when he was a kid. Um, and whether this compromises the authenticity of the Boys of England or strengthens its claim to be well placed to educate young boys, um, it's sort of a testament to the ill defined crossover of the violence of, kind of the imperial adventure stories at the time. So, uh, the, mission, the mission statement in the first issue of The Boys of England. Uh, sees the narrator encourage boys of low birth or humble origin not to let their circumstances prevent them from achieving uh, greatness, while the regular feature, Progress of a British Boy, um, The History of Britain, aims to, in its words, note the not unimportant, bo unimportant part boys have played in the formation of that national character, which is now considered the type of true manliness uh, and which is the true cause of England's moral as well as physical supremacy over the nations of the earth. Um, so the first issue of the Boys of England featured our sporting page in which it's announced that it has often been said, and with a certain amount of truth, that Englishmen take to the water as naturally as young ducks. Which seems an odd way of selling that to me. But, um, so whatever heroism is displayed, is to be displayed as an adult, um, is also expected to be evident in youths as well. So the journal promoted energetic activity, um, with stories extolling examples of English bravery and patriotism, um, with boys more often than not placed centre stage of its um, fictional stories and also its kind of historical accounts as well. So the primary placed on the heroism of the boy uh, and of the national importance of the boy uh, was also a common theme in the boy's own paper, which ran from 1879 to 1967, uh, which had uh, regular features like uh, some boys who became famous and boys of English history. So, so apparently youth is no bar to adhering to the standards of imperial um, adventure narratives at this point. So, the extent to which boys looked to these periodicals for instruction uh, is suggested by a regular feature um, when, in a lot of the magazines, which offered, uh, offered to answer any queries that the boys might have had. Um, and such pages of requests for information and advice for improvement are characteristic of boys' journeys. Um, and they exhibit a sort of appetite for the accumulation of seemingly arbitrary and random facts that Joseph Bristow has identified as one of the major defining features of imperial boyhood. Um, and the information requested in the Boys of England at times demonstrates an entertainingly eclectic eccentricity. Um, as the following examples demonstrate, it's got some kind of representative things that were asked by the, the readers of the magazine. Um, you never see the question itself, so you're left to infer what the question was from the answer given on the pages. So, um, to ABC in Cardiff, a woman is not liable for her husband's debts. Um, to a constant reader, wear a corn plaster and avoid tight boots. <laughs> some, some explanatory, good advice, I guess. Um, to E Ironside, if your chest and lungs are weak, you had better give up the cornet. Uh, <laughs> it all depends on the state of your health. Um, and to Curious, we shall not talk about the crocodile and the ways to catch it in our articles on angling. Um, so, and uh, there are many more along that vein. So at this point, it's, in, it's important to note that um, at the start of uh, an adventure story like King Solomon's Mines by uh, Ryder Haggard, 
The protagonist and adventurer and hunter, Alan Quatermain, records in lengthy detail uh, the necessary preparation of his journey into Africa. Um, and one suspects this would have really appealed to the readers uh, of the boy's own paper. Um, this is also repeated in um, How I Found Livingston by the uh, explorer Henry Morton Stanley, um, who details his own preparations for his journey through Africa, uh, saying that the purpose of this chapter is to relate how I set about it that other travellers coming after me may have the benefit of my experience. Um, so the literature of imperial masculinity, it seems, is overtly concerned um, with the dissemination of useful material. So uh, the correspondence pages seem to have held some special significance um, with the boys of England, uh, especially. Um, and if you look at its, its kind of, uh, some of its early years, if you look at the answers page, it becomes evident at one point that um, a rival journal going by a, a very similar name has, set, has been set up and is capitalizing on the success of Boys of England. And this results in a regular stream of letters from um, readers who are clearly uh, evidently asking um, whether the two journals are, are connected in some way or affiliated. Um, so the response to a boy called A Lover of Fair Play in issue 36 hints at the premium uh, on which the journal uh, placed uh, its own advice. Um, so this is the advice to A Lover of Fair Play. You are quite correct, not only has our style and ideas been copied, but even answers to our correspondence have been transfer transferred to the columns of our would-be rival. So you know, people are beginning to realize what's going on. Uh, and later in the same issue, um, one R.J. RJ Williams becomes the brunt of some editorial anger uh, when he is told that. So you don't see, again, you don't see the question, you just see the reply. And the reply is, you should insist on having the right journal instead of, of the miserable abortion you speak of. Don't have any spurious rubbish palmed off on you. Um, and this, the force of this response um, seems to be suggestive of an anxiety of control um, over the rationing of uh, knowledge and information to the young readership. Um, as well as could have lost sales, I think, from people not buying the right magazine. Uh, the Boys of England, um, at this point, is, is, is con constantly uh, looking to draw attention to any external endorsements of its, um, of its writing as well. And at one point, it points to a favourable review from the era, uh, which is a long-running a long weekly newspaper that became known for kind of sports reports. Um, and the era said that uh, Boys of England was of that wholesome and elevating character that must uh, recommend to every parent who desires to see his son's moral and manly feelings inculcated, uh, excellent as to inciting to courage, resolution, friendship, and honorable uh, emulation. There was a mass of most instructive and interesting reading. So the reaction of the boys of in England over challenges to its assumed role as the purveyor of advice um, and examples of moral masculinity is to cast its competitor as spurious. And with its uh, parodic doppelganger accused of impurity, its own ideology is by definition um, designated uh, uh, an, an official status or kind of sanctioned in some way. Um, in the words of its own correspondence page, our tales are successful because they are original and containing nothing injurious to the morals, thus we give pleasure and satisfaction to our readers. So this assumption of moral superiority as well as the publication's anxiety over um, epistemological control, is analogous to what uh, the Victorian professor of sociology, L.T. Hobhouse, saw as a, a totalitarianism and intolerance of intellectual independence uh, that he saw as characterizing imperialism. Um, fiercely identifying itself as the right journal. Um, the, the use of the term right denotes an advocacy of, kind of moral absolutism as opposed to democratic relativism. Uh, the Boys of England demonstrates what Hophouse sees as the imperial mentality. Um, the imaginative construction of manliness can be seen to ex uh, exemplify what Hophouse says in his words, uh, the empire's desire to weaken the basis of reason and disincline men to the searching analysis of their habitual ways of thinking to revert to the easy rule of authority and faith. So, at this point, We need to note the role of adventure fiction in setting out this ideal as well. So, uh, George Salmon in the Fortnightly Review in 1886, um, talking about adventure fiction at the end of the century, claimed that um, it would seem as though Englishmen sought to gratify mentally a passion for romance, where, which it was yearly becoming more difficult to gratify physically. As life has grown more prosaic, the records of stirring deeds have acquired enhanced charm. 
the modern youth compensates himself for the absence of the adventures and general excitement which characterise the times of Drake or Nelson, Clive or Wellington, by devouring the stories of the brave old days of old. Poured forth annually from the printing press, it is impossible to overrate the importance of the influence of such a supply on the national character and culture. So, we need to take a close look at the sort of literary constructions of adventurous masculinity that he might be talking about. And I think a good place to start uh, with, is with uh, Henry Morton Stanley, um, whose account of his search to find Livingston, uh, which was published as, imaginatively enough, How I Found Livingston, in 1872. I'm, I see you've all heard of the, the search for Livingston. It's the phrase, the phrase Dr. Livingston, I presume. Right. Um, it was a huge success uh, and a defining popular example of what Claire Pettit has called an urgent quest narrative at the end of the century. So Stanley, uh, who was a journalist for the New York Herald, um, who'd emigrated from Wales uh, to the USA when he was a boy, and subsequently fought for the South and then the North in the Civil War, uh, before just deserting it altogether and becoming a reporter in the Midwest. Um, he ended up working for the Herald, and in 1869, uh, he set out on a journey to locate um, Dr. David Livingston, who we've already met, who had gone to Africa to find the source of the Nile in 1866 uh, and had never come back, and little had been heard from him. Um, needless to say, uh, Stanley was successful, and his account of his journey was uh, wildly popular uh, with the American and British public as well. This is uh, no doubt helped by the fact that Livingston, you know, at, at one point had, held up a, had been held up at this model of Christian heroism. Um, despite his reputation taking a bit of a battering um, after a disastrous government-funded um, expedition to the Zambezi in um, 1858. So Stanley once again becomes a focus of national attention uh, later on in the 19th century uh, with his account of um, his explorations mapping Central African lakes, which was published as Through the Dark Continent in 1878. Uh, and later he led an expedition up the River Congo uh, in 1887 uh, to find Emin Pasha, the, uh, the governor of Equatoria, who was resisting a siege from, from local forces in the late 1880s. Um, so regular updates of Stanley's uh, progress at the Congo uh, appeared in the British press, um, and he just became this, kind of this, this wildly talked about and, and much read figure. So the importance of Stanley's expeditions is that in looking for Livingston, going searching for Livingston and, uh, and rehabilitating his heroic reputation, and then going to look for Emin Pasha, he enacted two adventurous searches for figures of idealized masculinity, uh, which I think kind of mirror the domestic desire to escape the city in search of an idealized masculine development that's going on in the, the urban escape programs at this point. However, traces of condescension can be found uh, in How I Found Livingston, in which Stanley points out that while, in his words, uh, stay-at-home, chimney-corner, and easy-chair-loving people may enjoy his book, uh, the most benefit from it will be gained by travellers. Um, Stanley, as Haggard goes on to do in The Witch's Head, um, turns the presumed domesticity of his readership into a mark of shame. So, um, Stanley's famous search for Livingston and the importance of Livingston himself in this concept is spelled out by the boy's own paper, which pointed out to its readers that to be a real man, uh, to be a true man, is the highest ambition a boy can have. And the first step towards its realization is to be the right kind of boy. This Livingston was. And we may be sure that Dr. Livingston would never have accomplished what he did if his boyhood had not been spent as well as it was. So, uh, the boyhood of existing imperial heroes was deemed worthy of examination by the kind of boy's own papers at this point, with articles like uh, the, boyhood of youth, of youth, uh, the Boyhood and Youth of Livingston, and David Livingston as Man and Boy. Um, with their imperial and masculinizing travel, Livingston and Stanley are models for the British boy, and boys' journals made sure to use them as instructive examples. However, we must uh, also pay attention to the extent to which these archetypal imperial adventure narratives actually reveal an anxiousness about performing the very masculinity that they were supposed to strengthen. And so we see that despite uh, his adherence to an idealized model of masculine adventurous travel, Stanley paradoxically, has the effect of frequently working to problematize um, this idea of energetic travel through the natural world. So, even his actual discovery of Livingston, which is ostensibly a stage of masculine self-development, um, is curiously compromised. Um, Stanley writes of when he kind of leaves Livingston after he's found him, that I had to tear myself away before I unmanned myself, 
Uh, before I could quite turn away, I betrayed myself. So he's talking about crying there. Um, explaining that this extract of his diary was written when my feelings were strong. I think he's trying to back out of it at this point. Um, Stanley nevertheless argues that I'm not ashamed of them. My uh, eyes feel somewhat dimmed in the recollection of, his, of our parting. Um, so if this seems to offer the possibility of a more emotionally receptive uh, imperial man, uh, Stanley totally ruins this immediately uh, by following it with a sort of reassertion of his kind of masculine credentials. So he carries on with his journey saying, uh, my people were driven before me. No more weakness. I shall show them, show them such marking, uh, marching as will make them remember me. So Stanley's idea of the imperial man at this point, so he's kind of showing off how tough he is. Um, and, and the image he's trying to put forward is often somewhat of an exaggerated caricature of what he thought um, he needed to be in the public eye. Um, so the thing about his famous greeting to Livingston, um, you know, when he finds him in the middle of Africa, Dr. Livingston, I presume, this is based on what he thought the sort of ideal stiff upper lip, um, nonchalant, uh, imperial adventure was meant to say. And so he was kind of playing a part to the extent that um, there was some doubt on whether, whether he actually said that or whether he just claimed to when he got back. And when he did get back in British musicals and theatres, it sort of became a running joke that he said this in Africa. You know, people saying, well, why are you acting like you're in a drawing room? This is a nonsense. You just march for a month through Africa. Or, and who else is it going to be if not David Livingston? Um, so it was seen as being kind of comically out of place. So even then, the idea of um, heroic masculinity is, is, is a bit shaky when he gets home. But it does remain that his particular brand of adventure was incredibly popular and influential on the Victorian Edwardian conceptions of empire. So, despite Livingston's earlier assertions, by the time of Through the Dark Continent, uh, Stanley was ambivalent about healthy African travel. Uh, he says that, I conclude that the climate of Ujiji agrees with the Arab constitution it certainly did not suit mine when I was with Livingston, for I, pun uh, I was punished with remittent and intermittent fever of such severe type and virulence uh, that in three months I was reduced in weight to seven stone. And there's more like this throughout, throughout his writings. Now there's a problem here in the imperial adventure stories were just gen generally constantly filled with disease and death. Uh, and the New York Herald, when it was running kind of Stanley's articles, used bylines like perils and losses by sickness to kind of drum up um, interest. Um, a potential resolution to this contradiction is found uh, in both in Livingston's comments and The Witch's Head by H. Ryder Haggard. It might be that it's not the country itself that is healthy, but the, the activity of travelling through it. But either way, we're, we're left with this paradoxical situation where the empire is unhealthy, but the act of exploration is healthy. Um, and it's this philosophy of kind of healthy travel that is applied back home in the escape programmes. So, anyway, back to Stanley. Um, and it seems that not everyone, according to Stanley anyway, is capable of manly travel. So, um, at one point he gets to a place called Casagira, and his rear guard and overseer, a guy called John William Shaw, who is one of the only two other Westerners on the exp uh, expedition, and also a conspicuous drinker, Stanley, make sure we know, tells Stanley that he cannot travel any further. And with Shaw weeping, as Stanley says, like a child, uh, Stanley... Uh, not the most sympathetic man in the world, informs him that you are simply suffering from hypochondria. You imagine yourself sick and nothing evidently will persuade you that you are not. Um, I think he probably was sick at this point, it's, it's fair to say. Um, but in Stanley's view, Shaw is a prime example of, in his words, the uneducated Anglo-Saxon uh, and his ineptitude for travel and intercourse with other races. So his lack of education and inability to survive in a competitive environment um, is, is kind of ludicrous in this, in this adventure context. As a hypochondriac, morbidly dwelling on his own problems, Shaw is, is somewhat unmanned, I think. Similarly, we are told from the start that uh, William L. Farker, who's Stanley's navigator, uh, is doomed to die due to his muddled condition and dissipated vicious life. Um, Farker's inability to survive in Africa is seen at an early stage in the journey where uh, uh, Stanley gives us this account of what he sees. Farker staggered out of his tent as changed from my spruce mate who started from Bagamoyo as if he had been expressly fattened by the Wabembe of the Tanganyika as we do geese and turkeys for the Christmas dinner. As interesting a case of hypertrophy as Barnum's fat women. And this is P.T. Barnum, the, the, the famous American circus owner and theatre owner and showman. So Stanley's analogy again um, questions the masculinity of what he calls this feebly intellectual white man. 
So Shaw and Farquhar are not exceptional enough to be imperial men. Uh, they're the only two other white men on the journey, apart from Stanley, and both of them fit for travel. So Africa, it seems, it seems as well as masculinizing, can feminize those who are susceptible. So it's a rather unreliable un kind of, um, uh, resource at this point. So I want to end this paper uh, by looking at G.A. Henty. Now, G.A. Henty was a regular contributor to uh, the magazine Young England. He also wrote for the boys' own paper. Uh, and briefly, but not entirely successfully, he edited another boys' journal called The Union Jack uh, between 1880 and 1883. It didn't last very long. He also uh, sailed with Stanley to the Gold Coast in 1873. However, uh, Henty is uh, most notable for his success and uh, prolificacy as a novelist, and he published what, more than 120 books in his lifetime, uh, only 11 of which were for adults. Um, and he did not merely regard himself and his works we well, did not merely regard his works as inconsequential adventure stories. Um, he saw them as having an actual role in moulding his readers, uh, saying that, um, I know that very uh, many boys have joined the cadets and afterwards got into the army through reading my stories. So for Henty, uh, boys' own stories have a direct impact on the masculinity of the nation's youth, um, and thus also eventually the state of its imperial and, and military might. So here's a, uh, just a, a representative piece of advice um, that featured in the Union Jack from, in an editorial by G.A. Henty. Um, so at the start of the, the, that issue, he tells readers that there are many good people who think that fighting is wrong uh, and that accounts of fights should not be inserted into boys' stories. I differ from them entirely. Courage and calmness are virtues which score quite often unexpectedly in afterlife, and courage and calmness are qualities exhibited and learned in the fighting ground. Uh, if two lads quarrel, it is a thousand times better that they should stand up and fight it out manfully and fairly and shake hands afterwards, uh, that they should indulge in bad feeling and mutual dislike, bickerings and bad language for weeks or months. Bullying uh, and quarrelsome fellows are hateful, but fighting puts an end to bullying. A bully is generally a coward. And in every school, some manly, generous lads will be found who are ready to take the part of small boys bullied by their elders. Uh, the knowledge that they must either fight or give up bullying generally keeps these school tyrants within moderate bounds. My advice to my own boys when they went to school was, uh, keep out of quarrels, my boys. Be always good-tempered and slow to take offence. Uh, but if you are forced into a quarrel, if in your own defence or in that of some ill-treated small boy, uh, you have to fight, then fight like a man. And as long as you see and stand, never give in. Now. The key phrase here is the instruction to fight like a man, uh, that the behaviour is something to be adopted or to be acted out. Similarly, if the lads that he's talking about are manly, the question is, you know, what does that make boys who don't fight? Um, so it's a, it's a process of unmanning, similar to the unmanning that, that Barker and Shaw go, undergo when they're out with Stanley. So Henty was by no means alone holding the view that his works actively instructed. Uh, the Times um, appraised his novel Li The Lion of the North in 1885, saying that the tale is a clever and instructive piece of history and that boys can hardly fail to be profited as well as pleased. Uh, and when it became apparent that the Union Jack, the magazine, was going to be discontinued, Henty, in a note to my readers, wrote that it was his aim to make the magazines not only entertaining, but a healthy and manly paper, and hope that his readers uh, will be armed and strengthened in the struggle before you by the lesson I taught in the pages of the Union Jack. Now, the same sentiment is uh, expressed by uh, a contemporary periodical called John Bull in its favourable review of a, a fairly well-known novel of Henty's called With Clive in India or the Beginnings of an Empire, uh, which is a story which, which loosely follows um, the East India Company's um, conquest of Bengal uh, in the 18th century and the career of the soldier Robert Clive. So finding the story to be uh, thoroughly interwoven with historical facts and powerful accounts of battles and conquests John Bull endorses the book as being healthy, in its words, and beneficial to all young persons who may read it, uh, congratulating both the author and the publisher for its obvious literary merits and timely and patriotic aims. Uh, one suspects it's more for the patriotic than the literary. Uh, the reviewer feels uh, that it has to praise the novel. Uh, certainly, Henty does not spare readers the history. At times, the book just seems like a, a kind of an extensive military manual uh, listing the kind of movements and statistics of various battles in uh, this 18th century um, combat in Bengal. Uh, 
So um, as I've said, Henty uh, wrote over 120 works, um, so by necessity I have to be selective in what I discuss, otherwise we're going to be here all week, and I'm sure nobody wants that. So um, I just want to take a quick look at Clive in India as representative of Henty's brand of adventure. Um, because he had a basic stock in trade where he would take events from British history um, and insert into them this fictional protagonist, uh, a young boy, who over the course of the novel uh, sort of discovers his heroic potential. Um, so we get uh, tales like uh, The Young Buglers, A Tale of the Peninsular War, or Winning His Spurs, A Tale of the Crusades, aka The Boy Knight, or A Tale of the Crimea, A Tale of the Boer War, with Peterborough in Spain, with Wolfe in Canada, with Lee in Virginia, with Kitchener in the Sudan, etc., etc. So in, with Clive in India, the boy hero uh, teams up with Robert Clive, the British officer crediting with uh, conquering areas of India for the, for the East India Company. Um, and there is a specific type of boy of Henty's, in Henty's novels, um, which Charlie Marriott, who's the protagonist here, exemplifies. And this is the, des the description we get right at the beginning of, with Clive in India. Okay. A tall lad of 16, he was slight in build, but his schoolfellows knew that Charlie Marriott's muscles were as firm and hard as any boy in the school. Uh, in all sports requiring activity and endurance, so not kind of snakes and ladders and chess, I suppose, rather than weight and strength, he was always conspicuous. Uh, not one in the school could compete with him in long distance running. He was a capital swimmer and one of the best boxers in the school. He had a reputation for being a leader in every mischievous prank, but he was honorable and manly and would scorn to shelter himself under the semblance of a lie. And he was a prime favorite with his masters as well as his schoolfellows. His mother bewailed the frequency with which he returned home with blackened eyes and bruised face. So there's the kind of rebelliousness of, of, of the earlier boy. Um, for between Dr. Willett's school and the Fisher lads of Yarmouth, there was a standing feud. Consequently, fierce fights often took place in the narrow rows, uh, and sometimes the Fisher boys would be driven back onto the broad quay shaded by trees by the river and there being reinforced from the craft alongside would resume the offensive and drive their opponents back into the main street. So the adventurousness and vaguely military uh, masculinity of Charlie here is, is a familiar one, I think, if we're looking at the, the urban escape programs. However, with Clive in India, exhibits uh, a tension with imperial ideology at the end of the 19th century. So, for example, while it proclaims in its subtitle to be a, the account of, a, of the beginnings of empire, it essentially functions as an exercise in retrospectively removing the motivating factor of financial gain from British imperialism. So um, the India in Henty's novel is a place for the dash and daring of English troops, where daring and confidence as usual prevailed. Um, and alongside kind of numerous uh, variations of dash and daring and pluck in the novel, um, there is a, a noticeably disapproving stance towards money. So there's this tension between adventurous masculinity and the financial aspect of, of empire, um, because the financial aspect is unavoidably bound up with kind of city-based uh, desk-bound office jobs rather than outdoors um, energetic exploration. So at the start of the novel, Charlie is sent by his father to work in the offices of the East India Company. Um, and upon his arrival at Madras, he is left under no illusions about what he can expect from his work as a writer. Uh, so he's newly housed at a place called The Factory, which kind of implies men being turned into machinery at this point. Um, Charlie sees his fellow workers for the first time when he attends dinner that evening and is, in his words, struck with the pallor of their faces and the listless air of most of them. He's then met um, by an older writer called Johnson, who wastes no time uh, in telling Charlie uh, that he looks refreshingly healthy and well and that he, looks, he used to look comparably well uh, but that eight years of stewing in this horrible hole that takes the life and spirits out of anyone quill driving in a stuffy room. Uh, now, Charlie's optimistic response is that early morning rides might do one good, uh, but this is met with the statement from Johnson that many of the writers take up exercise when they first arrive, but that after a time they lose their energy. So in such work, as a writer, innovation is inevitable and robbed of their essential vitality uh, the young writers are uh, kind of comparable with the targets of the Fresh Air Fund and the Boys Brigade back in, back in Britain. So we are then informed uh, that this is the fault of mercenary businessmen. As Johnson states, our chiefs think of nothing but trade and care nothing about how squalid and miserable is the place in which they make money. So by the time Robert Clive, the famous soldier, arrives, 
uh, and declares that I have, thank God, exchanged my pen for a sword. This connection between static office work and enfeebled masculinity contrasted against a more military heroism um, has been comprehensively made, I think. So unsurprisingly, uh, our hero Charlie wastes no time in requesting to be transferred to serve under Clive and kind of leaves, leaves his office job behind. So once again, decadent masculinity can only be cured uh, by compliance with an imperial model uh, of explorative recreation. So Charlie and his two sidekicks, again, this is a late 19th century adventure story that revolves around three men going to a different country. Um, Charlie swashbuckles his way around India, um, seemingly winning territory for the East India Company single-handedly in a very unrealistic way. Um, uh, you know, all is well. However, later on in the story, we have this kind of subplot where Clive is party to a plot to depose the Nabob of Morshedaban by promising his general the kingdom if he were to turn traitor. Um, and this is a deal which would pay um, Clive enormous amounts of money, as it's put. Um, I think Clive is set to receive something like 2 million and 80,000 rupees. At this point, Omichand, a local merchant who helps, um, who's helped the English in the past, finds out about the deal and demands a share of money. So in order to cheat this Omichand uh, out of his share, Clive and his council draw up two treaties, um, which are identical, apart from in one, Omichand is cut out of the deal, and in the other, he's included in the deal. Uh, and the, and the, the, the plan is to destroy the second treaty um, after Omichand is convinced that his position is secure. So in order to achieve this, Clive forges the signature of an officer who refuses to be party to the deception. And in the opinion of the narrator of With Clive in India, uh, these dealings form the most unpleasant feature in the life of Clive. A more disgraceful transaction was never entered into by a body of English gentlemen, uh, proving the conspirators to be as greedy and grasping as Omichand himself. Um, the interesting thing about this is, um, not only is it based on something that actually happened, but it is entirely representative of the East India Company at the time. So uh, this aversion to money uh, and greed is also evident in an earlier chapter, in chapter 17, in fact, where Charlie inquires as to the defensive capabilities of Calcutta. Is that? And he's informed by a local merchant that uh, the fortifications have been neglected due to the representatives of the East India Company being shamefully preoccupied with their own trading ventures. Um, so with Clive in India, wrestles with this kind of troubling imperial conundrum. I mean, how do you resolve the fact that these uh, arenas of imperial heroism were historically founded by organizations entirely defined by their business concerns. Um, you know, the East India Company is, is a trading organization. So as a result, the narrative is forced to idealistically reshape the past to conform to its present late Victorian ideals, namely the, I, the idolizing of adventurous masculinity and a contempt for unheroic office jobs. Um, this is also seen in, in, in words by um, H. Ryder Haggard as well. If you go to King Solomon's Mines, there's a bit towards the end where the ruler of this uh, mythical and undiscovered African country uh, states that he's, he's going to make sure the boundaries, are sh the, boun the boundaries of his country are shored up so tradesmen don't get in, uh, which is something he's worried about. So in order for India to be this requisite stage for imperial masculinity, with Clive in India is uh, left with the ludicrously contradictory task of celebrating the East India Company's conquest of India whilst at the same time purging it of any debating commercialism, which is impossible. Right? So the result of this economic exorcism, um, is, well, the result is that the, the reader is absurdly presented with an East India company which promotes dash and pluck, which condemns financial ventures. So the view of With Clive in India of being beneficial to its readership arguably, arguably has less to do with its kind of historical accuracy as it does with its willingness to mold that history to fit in with an idea of empire that is more indebted to contemporary politics. Um, and we can see that in John Bull's acknowledgement, that in, uh, acknowledgement um, and signaling out of the, of the story's patriotic aims for special praise. So ironically, the text that we're looking at here consistently and subtly undermine notions of heroic masculinity and how realistic gold it is uh, for those reading instructive tales of heroism. Uh, there is a weakness in imperial masculinity. Uh, Andrew Roberts, uh, Andrew Roberts' definition of masculinity is useful to frame this argument, I think. He says that uh, masculinity then might be regarded as a psychic structure, as a fantasy, as a code of behavior, or as a set of social practices and constraints. To describe it as an ideology 
uh, brings all of these together. Um, it is a representation of the imaginary relationship of individuals to their real conditions of existence. And of course, he's quoting Louis Althusser's definition of ideology there. So in this way, the ideology of imperialism becomes synonymous with an ideal, ideology of masculinity. Uh, national and masculine worth are equivalent, uh, and the narratives of boys' own literature collude with the urban escape of the boys' brigade to make sure a kind of a legitimate masculinity was promoted in popular culture. Um, however, as we've seen, this pretense of manliness uh, cannot help but betray its own doubts and insecurities um, about the solidity of its ideals. And I just want to finish up by going back to the boys' brigade for a minute. So, uh, aptly enough, I think a common hazard that seems to have been faced by the boys' brigade, um, the, the kind of the individual companies of the brigade, uh, were verbal and physical attacks from local boys. Um, Roger Peacock's account of the founding of the boys' brigade recalls a highly organized underground movement whose purpose was to conduct a continuous guerrilla campaign against the boys' brigade often was a drill parade conducted under a fusillade of stones and bricks. And there are a lot of the accounts of this going on. Um, so yeah, there are other people who kind of talk about this. Um, and these reports suggest that kind of brawls with kind of local kids uh, were common. Uh, and we know that this kind of hostility from other children found expression in a sort of comic um, schoolyard rhyme that was kind of going around at the time. And the rhyme was, can't do the accent. Um, the rhyme was, here comes the boys' brigade, all smothered in marmalade. It's not the height of wit, but there are All smothered in marmalade, a tuppenny apenny pillbox, and half a yard of braid. The pillbox and the braid are referring to a very distinctive uniform the brigade used to wear. They used to wear a pillbox hat and used to have some gold braid along their, their jacket. So they're mocking the distinctive uniform. And what we are faced with here is that the boys of the brigade, rather than impressing with their attempts of imperial manliness, are instead mocked for their pretensions, you know, rather than the conquering force of adventure. Um, they are beset kind of by angry uh, urban natives. Um, the apostrophe uh, the, of arf and ear in that rhyme signals the East End accent of the attackers. Uh, and these are the very boys, these East End uh, you know, city lads, that the escape programs were meant to educate and reform. And here, uh, they are driving away their conquerors uh, and rejecting their comic pretensions to military masculinity. So it seems that the, um, the boys from the Young England sketch at the start who didn't really quite know what apples were um, would not be so easily convinced uh, or so easily conquered by the image of the heroic boy of empire. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, David, would you be willing to take questions now from the audience? Yes, of course. Yes? Okay. As long as they're nice. Does anyone have questions for David? Do we have questions? Okay. Can I ask about the seaside? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. I was thinking that um, in the context of Britain, it's an imperial navy. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be a huge amount of emphasis in what at least we've been talking about today on the seaside or that sort of military preparation mm. for the Sure. Um, that's quite, I mean, it, it does kind of, I mean, you're right that, that this was important. It does kind of, uh, kind of bleed in. Uh, gradually, I think a lot of the camps are, but from the Boys' Brigade, are by the sea. Um, there are constant articles in Boys' of England about uh, sailing, uh, fishing, rowing, things like that. Um, and I think, it's, I think you're right to point that out in something like with Clive in India, he gets in very early that, that um, Charlie Marriott lives by the sea at that point. I think his, his, very, his, kind of, his, his sheer presence by the sea signals that he's, the, he's going to be a kind of an adequate imperial man at some point. Um, I think it crops up a fair bit, not uniformly though, and not, I don't know, it never seems to, they never seem to be making a great big deal about it, that it's always kind of a presence. Well, one thing I do look at, interestingly enough, is I was kind of shoehorning uh, mentions of office workers uh, in there in a way that I hope didn't seem too forced. Um, one thing I, I look at is uh, kind of lower middle class office working adults and how they kind of shape their masculinity in contrast to these kind of popular adventure fictions by kind of H. Ryder Haggard and things like that. Um, and you get a lot of uh, kind of seaside holiday narratives uh, at this time. So um, writers like Jerome K. Jerome and other kind of comic writers in the 80s and 90s. 
Uh, it'll be kind of office workers go for a bank holiday to see the Navy display or go down Margate. Margate crops all up, crops all up, as does the Armour as well. So the sea doesn't appear to be an important thing. Um, I, d I don't know if I've answered your question. But yeah, I think, yes, you're right, good observation is what I want to say. Thank you. You mentioned the uh, uh, musicals would sometimes make light of, uh, you know, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Yeah. And you mentioned the rhyme, the schoolboy rhyme mm. attacking the uh, uh, the Boys Brigade. Were there any serious parodies or, uh, or even in the media, really serious responses to the, the whole movement? Um, Counter responses, of course. Uh, to, to, the, to the brigade movement? To specifically. the brigade movement, yeah. Um, I've not seen any overt attacks on right. them. I guess I'm trying to kind of read, read between the lines at this point. Um, there's one thing I look at are a lot of um, kind of comic novels at the end of the century which, which show adults having to get out of the city. Um, they you know, things like, again, Three Men on a Boat, Three Men on the Bummel, um, History of Mr. Polly, things like that. And so, um, and they sort, they sort of, um, they're not, so, they're not um, satirical or, or kind of overtly political, but they have a kind of, they play with this idea of having to escape in a sort of a wry manner. Um, which I think is, is the closest I've seen to people really critiquing the idea that you have to get out and talk about it. I know, it's kind of cynicism, because it yeah. certainly lends itself to a it does, yeah. parody. Yeah, it does. I think, I think something like Three Men in the Boat is a parody of it, I think I would contend, but, um, but not, so, not so openly as it would state it on the, on the title page, I think. Yeah. But, um, but certainly the, these, the idea of kind of grown men trying to go on short country breaks and it not going well be becomes a sort of thing at this sure. point. So I think that's as close as I've seen to a concerted critique of it. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's a sort of kind of read between the lines, blink and you'll miss it sort of critique. But in the media, in the newspapers, you didn't come across. I haven't yet. I haven't yet, but that's not to say it doesn't exist. Right. But I haven't, I haven't seen that. You were talking about this uh, desire to get out of the cities and escape into the countryside yeah. during the late 19th century. Um, and this becomes a time when walking tours and guidebooks become increasingly important. Yeah. Um, and people are going to places like Bronte Country and it's advertised as just a cheap day out for workers who have half holiday or who have a day out. Mm. And you also mentioned that there's the sense that um, the, Eng the English soil, there's something kind of inherent in the English soil that it's an invigorating kind of thing. Did you see any evidence of walking tours for boys in, in these periodicals and publications? Was there ever um, a section that said, here, you can go on this kind of domestic adventure? The, the, the magazine, I can't think of any specific examples. The, the magazines do deal with a, if you go out into the countryside, things you can look for and do sort of thing. Um, I know um, Boys of England tried to organise a club, a nature walk club, but had to, had to pull the idea because not enough boys signed up for it at some point, but um, not, not in a formalised sense, although I, I, I know there were kind of walking tours set up as well. I know there was, I've come across something, uh, there were things called uh, kind of bean feasts and um, gypsy parties as well, where kind of employers would have a sort of social responsibility for at the end of the year or on a bank holiday, take all their workers out to the country um, on a boat trip or just to a local field or something like that and, and give them some food in the fresh air. Um, so, the, yeah, I've seen some examples of that, but I know that that was a, a big thing, which obviously this kind of ties into. So it's, I know maybe I've kind of misrepresented it in sort of ghettoising it in the sort of uh, kind of youth child culture, but this thing was also being applied to adults as well. I think, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I, yeah, I have a question. You mentioned earlier on, I went to a slightly different context about um, leadership and the way that um, these kind of um, fresh air books have been, been carried in a knowing way that the reader will um, have an understanding of natural environment that, that the boys that are kind of subject to the joke simply don't have. And I just wondered, 
um, in terms of things um, like these kind of boys magazines, um, what expectation is there that there is a kind of, I know it's obviously for, for you and the reads, but there is um, just a kind of inborn appreciation of the values of the kind of, um, the value of nature, that idea that there is something um, kind of invigorating about the um, adventure narrative and the expression narrative, and how far are they, or are they having to kind of teach a kind of mode of reading? If that makes sense. You mean the, the magazines themselves? Yeah, what kind of assumptions are they making about? I guess it's just really about who they're expecting to have to read their um, publications and how well equipped they are to interpret them. Well, this is, this is, the, this is the kind of the inherent um, self undermining um, problem with something like the Boys' Own Paper and the Boys' Brigade itself. Now, where they started off, it was to get Kind of destitute. It kind of moves up the social ladder. So the original, the original, the initial ones are to get kind of destitute kids out. By the time you get to the boys' brigade, it's comfortable children of kind of white collar working families, um, and the boys' own paper in Young England as well are, are kind of aimed at kind of middle class, upwardly mobile families as well. So I think they are expected. To ha I mean, you can see that the, the joke at the front. There was a definite assumption that you are you were definitely not one of these kids. These we, these, these sort of children are not our readers. Um, and you know, the, the articles do get quite detailed in terms of their kind of history, um, accounts of history and, and, and kind of science and things like that. At that point. So I think they're assuming a certain level of education, um, and there's not much kind of hand holding. I think they they, they assume the kids will sort of come equipped to deal with what they're telling them. And I wonder if that's kind of dealing with, well, we saw the, um, you know, Englishmen take to water as, young uh, as easily as young ducks. You know, they don't need to be taught. They just, you throw them into a river and they'll float and c construct a raft out of some driftwood or something like that automatically. And I wonder if there's a similar sort of, well, if you are a, a British boy, if you are an English boy, this will make sense to you sort of thing. There's a sort of an assumption that the natural heroism will kind of inculcate an ability to get to grips with the topic. But, um, I know I definitely need to think about it a bit more, thanks. Thank